Welcome to Understanding Russia, a student-led podcast from Belgorod State University. In this episode, we're going to do something I've been wanting to do for a while, and that's talk to my friend Val. Val is a native of Well, it's hard to say. He was born in Yorkshire and he moved to the USSR at an early age, a long time ago. We're going to encounter a couple of historical facts, which I need to explain before we carry on. At one point in the story, he mentions the fact that his father was Polish and eventually ended up joining the British Army. This may confuse some of you, but during the war, a lot of Polish soldiers found themselves in captivity in both the USSR and in Nazi Germany. The USSR Polish were given the option to travel through Iran and join up with the British army who were in the process of fighting the Nazis at that point. And Val's father found himself via a circuitous route joining the British army, in fact, the parachute regiment, and taking part in some of the most significant operations of the war. When I arrived in Russia, I thought I was the only native speaking Englishman in this city. It turned out I was wrong about that and Val's reputation preceded him. I very much looked forward to meeting him. And when I did, I wasn't disappointed and you won't be disappointed when you hear his story it's fascinating in june this year it'll be 60 years since i left england and i remember that day as it were yesterday yes it was a nice sunny day the 15th of june 1959 they lined up the whole school to say farewell to me it was a very touching tear-jaking moment and uh, so the school said goodbye to me I said goodbye to the school then I went to my English grandma's place we got into the taxi waved goodbye to my English grandma and granddad the thing that sticks in my memory is Uh, my English grandma, I call her mum, how she started running after the taxi, crying, almost falling all over her feet. She was so upset that I was leaving. At that time, I was a bit overexcited because it was a big adventure to me. My parents told me, look, we're going to Russia and there you have many cousins and aunts and uncles and you get to meet so many relatives. So, and the journey itself, Travelling by train to London, right on the Yorkshire Pullman, was a real treat. Because in those days, we never really got to go anywhere. I mean, apart from uh, an annual holiday in Blackpool, that's about it. We had to stay put most of the time because uh, we weren't very mobile in those days. No private cars, no nothing apart from, uh, well, we were lucky if we had a, a bicycle. So this great adventure down to London, a couple of days in London, then a a five-day voyage from London to St. Petersburg on a ship which called in uh, at Copenhagen, Stockholm, Helsinki, and then another long train journey across half of Russia to my mother's motherland, to her home village, meeting the relatives, and then moving, going from uh, Russia, which is Kaluga region, not far from Moscow, to Belarus to uh, meet my father's relatives. Mm -hmm. So, Practically all summer was like one big party, Uh, meeting relatives, traveling, parties every, practically every day because the prodigal daughter and the prodigal son, son have finally come home after almost 20 years of being lost to their relatives. Nobody knew whether they were dead or they were alive because that, during the war, came back in 1959. What did you know about the Soviet Union as then was before you came back? Nobody called it the Soviet Union in those days. It was known as Russia. And, uh, well, I know, I knew uh, bits and pieces from what my parents used to tell me. My mother was from Russia, from Kaluga. My father, he was born and grew up in Western Belarus, but until 1939, that was part of Poland. <clears throat> so he um, actually grew up as a Pole. So it was like my father was Polish citizen, my mother was Russian, and uh, I didn't know who I was, but I was born into a completely English environment. Right. I grew up as an English kid because I went to school and I was brought up by these two old people I mentioned at the beginning, who I called mum and dad, and they took to me as if I were their grandchild. Because when my father came to Bingley after he was demopped from the army, he got a job in the textile industry. I started working at a textile mill in Bingley and he was lodging with these people. And uh, they were an elderly couple, childless. So then my father married and he brought his wife to this place and continued lodging. Then I was born and these two people, they took to me as if I were their grandchild. So basically, uh, during my all my life in England, I spent more time with them and live with them, uh, with them than with my parents. And I called them mum and dad 
and it, it stayed like that all the time. So you really didn't know much about the motherland? As, no, not really. Were. Just well, what my parents told me a little bit. And, of course, this was uh, the late 50s when the Soviet Union launched its first satellite mm -hmm. and then the second. So that news started going uh, going around. And I remember we used to go out into the street and at night and look up at the sky and see if we could see the Sputnik. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Uh, Did you see it? No. <laughs> now, interesting. Now uh, it's no problem to see a Sputnik at night. When mm -hmm. I go to Belarus and you know there's no light pollution there mm. in the village and there's a very clear sky in August so every night you can see Sputniks crisscrossing the, yeah. the sky and but the in space those, station yes yeah. but in those days you know everyone's out in the streets I remember there are crowds of people out in the streets in Bingley on a starry night looking up at the sky and see if they could see the Sputnik <laughs> yeah they could hear it couldn't they because there's a radio transmission yeah there's beep but there were beeps yes beeps. So, but that was about that you're listening to Understanding Russia. So did you think of yourself as a, an English boy or did you feel like, well, I'm English, but my roots are in no, Russia? No, I, I considered to be completely English, apart from my name, yeah. of course. So my name was Polish and uh, Valentin, everyone called me Valenti. Oh. They didn't even call me Val. They called me Valenti for some reason. At school, the teachers all always called me Valenti. So, okay, fine. So I never even thought about it. The decision to move back for my parents came in the late 50s again during what is known as the Khrushchev Thaw, when uh, Khrushchev denounced Stalin and Stalinism and relations between the West and uh, Russia started to thaw, get warmer. And that was a time when we got our first TV set and uh, Russian folk groups, musicians, they kept coming in hordes to England. And uh, my mother would sit in front of the television. She watched the famous Biryoska dance troupe, then the Voronish choir, then the Red Army dance group and the uh, choir. And she would be crying and it was really upsetting, really. So uh, then they started talking about since the situation has changed because they couldn't go back uh, when Stalin was alive because of the prosecutions and stuff. They started, I didn't know about that, but I felt that something was going on because my father started traveling to London. London of all places. Right. <laughs> Why would he be traveling to London? And what he was actually doing, he was traveling to the Soviet embassy and he was asking if the embassy could help find uh, rel any relatives left in the Soviet Union because they had no, no information. And uh, yeah, it took some time, but finally the embassy sent some information back to us that they'd found uh, the relatives of my mother in Kaluga region. Those, they started corresponding and through my mother's relatives, they managed to trace my father's relatives in Belarus. So that's how this triangle started working. We started getting letters and photos from them and they kept saying, come back, it's great here. Yes, we're happy to see you and to know that you're alive. Come back home. We're waiting for you, blah, blah, blah. So it went on for about a couple of years and uh, then things started happening. When did your parents meet? How did that happen? Well, that was, uh, well, first of all, how they ended up in England. Uh, uh, my mother, she lived in a village in Kaluga region. She was 19 when the war started. And when the Germans came, you know what they did? They rounded up the youth and shipped them out to Germany and put them to forced labor. She stayed in, uh, I think it was Wuppertal, for four years until the end of the war. My father, since he was a Polish citizen, he uh, joined the army and um, he was with uh, the paratroopers. He went, he traveled around the world for a while and then they finally came to England. They started training with the British paratroopers and he took part in this disastrous market garden operation with the Polish brigade alongside with the uh, English Airborne Division. Yeah. So he was in that uh, battle and uh, then he stayed in the army until 1946 because he was in Germany for about a year, I think, or more with the occupation forces. And my mother, she uh, happened to end up in the uh, British controlled zone when Germany was taken and split into zones and areas and she uh, managed to get to England. That's where they met because they both got jobs in the textile industry. 
So that's where they met and eventually they got married and that's how it all started. For your parents coming back to Russia in those days was a big political decision to make. For you it was almost a complete shock. You had no idea it was coming or you had some clues maybe but you didn't realise what was going on at the time. You were very young. You were 11 when you came back, right? Yes. You say you came on a, on a, on a ship. You took this amazing journey through post-war Europe. In fact, it was still post-war Europe some few years after the war. When you crossed into the Soviet Union what struck you? Was it exciting? Was it intimidating? What were the border guards like? The trip itself, the journey, including the voyage, was all fun. It was fun all the way. And it was a Russian ship that we were travelling on, and the crew were very nice, and it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, we sailed to Leningrad and we came to the port. You could see that most of the port area was still in ruins. So it was a very depressing picture. And people who came to meet the boat, all dressed in khaki military style costumes, boots and wearing caps and these uh, cotton padded coats. It was such a depressing picture. So it was, no, it was absolutely, absolutely okay getting off. It was no problem because they were prepared for us. They were, they were inviting us. I mean, we didn't go on our own will, of our own will, basically, because the embassy, uh, when they had established contact with our relatives, they started urging us to go back and giving us promises that, look, everything will be fine. You'll be well looked after. Your parents will get a job and the kids will go to school and you'll get accommodation. So there are all these promises that, uh, you know, made my parents make that decision. We were put into the hotel in the center. So we were assigned a what you call him, well, actually a guide of some sort, right? To be with us. A minder. A minder, yeah. Right. So he took us around the town and showed us things. And uh, But the only thing that I couldn't do was eat the food. <laughs> I mean, I just couldn't. And when we were brought to this canteen and uh, there's only a spoon and a fork and my mother said, well, I remember that. So they served us she, that cabbage soup. Oh, right. Right. Based on the base was uh, pickled cabbage. And I, I just put me off my food straight away because of the smell and everything. Never seen anything like that before. And that coming from Britain. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, but interesting enough, now I treat these things as delicacies <laughs> after so many years. Yes. Anyway, I got. Uh, we have this fork. We have a spoon. There's no knife. And uh, I got very upset. <laughs> so I didn't eat any dinner. You can take the boy out of England, but you can't take England out of the boy. Well, yeah. probably, Where's yeah. my knife? Yeah, no knife. Yeah. No knife. That's it. So I refused to eat any food. The food problem continued for a long time because when we arrived finally at my mother's village, Luga region, well, in those days, there were practically no roads. There were only tracks across fields. And we were met by, uh, by my mother's uh, younger brother and some relatives. Uh, he was a truck driver, so he came in his truck. And so we all were packed into that truck and we, we drove over open fields during the night. Mm -hmm. And so I had no idea where we were going, what were we were doing. We wow. came to this village and there was no light. And I said, where are we? Where's the house? And they point me at a hut. That's our house. And there was no light because in those days, uh, they switched the light off at 11 o'clock at night. There's no light. They had these little kerosene lamps. So, and uh, the next day, my grandmother, who I'd met for the first time, my mother's mother, took me and my brother to the shed where she kept the, the cow and the animals. And she wanted to be a nice grandmother, right? And she wanted to treat us uh, some fresh milk straight from the cow. So we went into the barn and I mean, well, of course, you can imagine what it was like. And she started milking the cow and I could see all this stuff in the barn. And, and then she gave us the milk and uh, I just couldn't do it. I almost threw up. <laughs> So I never imagined that this is what it looked like, where the milk came from, really. Wow. Because in England, at school, we got bottles of milk yeah. every day and I had no problem with that. I could drink, you know, two bottles, no problem. No problem. Uh, so I had no problem with milk then. So, but now, 60 years on, I've never had a drop of fresh milk. Never. And that goes back to that day when my granny wanted to give me some milk fresh from under the cow. You're listening to Understanding Russia. 
So was it still an adventure for you or was this the beginnings of culture shock? It was an adventure while the parties lasted. Parties, meeting relatives, going to going visiting, traveling to Belarus, this, going through the same thing again. It lasted for a couple of months. Then we were given a an old house to live in and this is when reality started to set in. So you were starting to cope with life in a new reality. Your mother had been quite emotional before coming back to yeah. Russia, obviously missed it a lot. Did you see a big change in her? She was very Russian all the time, but English lifestyle still had a big impact on her. When she came to Russia, she was used to dressing up. She'd acquired that English habit of women being nicely dressed, even at home, no dressing gowns, no aprons and things. She had to be dressed up properly with enough makeup and things. And here she is in this hut, right? And there's dirt everywhere, but she still tried to keep that image because she got Got used to it. My father as well, he was always wearing proper trousers, a shirt with his sleeves rolled up, a tie and a kind of jumper. It was, I mean, they looked very, very English. And people didn't like that. They, they kept calling them, oh, Anglicani, Anglicani, mm -hmm. capitalist Anglicani. But that was their normal image because that's the way they got used to when they were living in England. And uh, that affected them. Yeah, they were rather upset about all this treatment and things gradually changed. It was, uh, it was rather difficult and for all of us, even for my parents who come home really but well for my brother he was seven then it was it was an adventure all the way no problem with him he had no problem with making friends very quickly he knew no russian neither did i but he was out there all the time mixing with his new friends no problem with food he just you know felt at home but my parents were very depressed at first i was in a horrible state i was thinking of running a <laughs> running away and they said look i want to go back home i want to go back home and i want to see mom and dad and uh, my parents told me, look, you can't. I said, why can't I go back home? They said, look, and they explained to me that the, the officials, the authorities had taken away our English documents and gave us Russian ones instead. So we were locked in, basically. Did your parents think it was a mistake to come back? Well, the... basically, at first they had ideas like that because lifestyle was entirely different from they'd got used to living in england it was a step course. down it was really a step yeah. down yes but you know you get used to everything and gradually things started picking up and with some help from the relatives of course supported us morally and in whichever way they could we went to school i started speaking russian and belarusian we decided to settle in belarusia because kaluga was a really depressed area and belarusia was at least a small town in those days Days, it was a district center. It's a small place called Juratishki. It's uh, no, nobody's heard of it. So we decided to settle there, and uh, it, there was more action there, and uh, so we got used to it. Probably my first two years were the most horrendous ones because you know culture shock going on for about two or more years. But then step by step, when I started making friends, doing successful at school, getting involved in community activities, doing sport. I mean, children do adapt very quickly. Yeah. You, how much of you is still back in England? I'm in England just as much as I am in Russia, but my England is the England of the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but see, Apart from having dual citizenship, I think I have dual mentality as well, because I understand the British mind, especially now when, we, when uh, the situation in the world is so miserable and the relations are so miserable between our two countries and between the East and the West. I understand the British mind and why they look upon Russia in such a way. And I can switch on my Russian mentality and I understand perfectly well the Russian side of the problem. So it's like uh, I have a combination of two mentalities, which makes it much easier for me, for instance, to communicate with both sides. And it's really a shame that it's like this. I remember the time 30 years ago when we had such a thing called, called people's diplomacy. That's where I really felt like, you know, a fish in the water, just totally comfortable with dealing with people to people things. Mm -hmm. If we could bring that back, that might have helped. You've made a career out of cultural communication. What over the years do you think is the most important thing you've brought to the Russian understanding of the Western mindset? I did a dissertation on that actually. And a lot of my work through teaching English is really about talking about the 
uh, the British mentality, which is still in me, and which I get from socializing with the British and by reading the press. I'm always try, I always try to keep abreast with what's happening, of course, and I have friends and I travel and I visit and we talk. So all this is embedded into the language that I teach. See, the thing is, it's very important because when you're teaching language, you're not just teaching grammar and words and phonetics, you're teaching the mindset as well. For instance, we know that Russian language is very imperative by its structure. English is not. So when Russian learners of English start speaking English and they miss the British or the English etiquette, what they're doing is speaking Russian English because they're still being imperative using English like they do in Russian, which is unacceptable. So teaching things like that, British things, not just language, but cultural and etiquette things, is uh, something that I've been doing for years. When Russians meet you as a sort of Anglo-Russian, as it were, do they treat you any differently to the way they treat other teachers, for example? Uh, you mean Russian teachers or...? Well, Russian people, when they meet yeah. you and they understand your background, does it give you an advantage? Does it allow you to open doors? Well, in many ways, yes. In, I mean, I've been in Belgrade for 40 years now, right? And, uh, well, being in one place and doing the same job for 40 years, well, creates some kind of imi image. And, well, I hope that the image is more or less positive because I, I still keep teaching. I'm a senior, but I seem to be in demand and they keep asking me to do these courses here, there and everywhere, which is a good sign. It means that, you know, I can still be active and people relate to me professionally, which is very nice. Well, I've given up interpreting before when we had very active relations with the West. I used to be interpreter for quite a few big wigs in my own time. So that really, as you say, helped me open quite a few doors because once again, everyone knew that I was the person to go to since I understood the West and I understood the East. Mm -hmm. So the English related to me as a Russian, the Russians related to me as an Englishman. And that helped a lot because I could make things happen, bring two sides together. You're listening to Understanding Russia. That interview was conducted a while ago, and we sat down more recently to conclude our interview on the subject of the Soviet Union. Now, the Soviet Union looms large in the imagination, but the experience of the Soviet Union was not as we imagine it in the West. Well, there's, there's, there's this thing for nostalgia for the Soviet Union. I mean, you lived through the Soviet Union. Yeah. And it's nice, I suppose, to go back in a way and relive some of the things of your youth. Is it worth a nostalgia trip to go down memory lane to the Soviet Union? Well, uh, no. Well, maybe on certain occasions, you know, people's uh, relations, I mean, they were different in those days. I think they were more honest, right? And uh, Simple folk. Well, simple, yeah. And simple in many ways. So... But there was definitely a collectivist view of the world, wasn't it, in those days? Well, yes, there was. And that was a good thing. That was a very positive thing, right? People tried to help other people and this spirit of collectivism was there. And, uh, well, that was a, a good thing about Soviet time, apart from, you know, all the other political problems and probably food shortages and other shortages, consumer goods and things. I mean, but it was, uh, when you're young, it's, it doesn't seem to matter much because uh, you have ambitious plans. You want to do something. You want to get there, right? So uh, you spend most of your time trying to achieve what you're trying to achieve. What was your ambition? My ambition, well, I mean, when I graduated from the university in Minsk, I thought that I would be able to stay at the university and be a university teacher at my university because it was a specialized university, foreign languages. And, uh, well, my level of language was way higher than, you know, the average graduate or even the teachers because, you know, as a native speaker, I had those plans that I, you know, become a university professor. But no, it didn't happen. Why not? Well, I'm still asking myself that question. Why not? I mean, I would have been probably the apparent choice to, you know, to remain at the university. And... Were you uh, an unreliable foreigner? Well, yeah, that would be the possible answer, right? Yes. I thought, well, maybe they didn't trust me that much, right? And so they shipped me out to where I'd come from. <laughs> Meaning... <laughs> Send him back. <laughs> <laughs> so they sent me back to the village where I grew up. Faulty goods. Yeah. I had to work for, what, three years, I think. Uh, what were you doing? Well, I had a wide range of duties because uh, 
The school only had German. Well, I knew a bit of German, so, you know, enough to teach German at school level. And in our town, we had a medical college. And there they had uh, English, German, and French. Well, at the university, I had English and French as my two main languages. And on top of that, I had some German. So I taught German at school and I taught English and French at the uh, college. And I was only, what, 24. Quite a responsibility. Oh, yes. And uh, right. And the college, the medical college was full of girls and, and nice. things. So, yeah, that was, you know, that was fun, really. So I didn't miss anything. I didn't miss the university. It was all fun. Were you the only teacher there for, of those disciplines? Well, there was one other teacher. Yeah, there were two or three of us. I think there were two of us. Yeah, as far as I recall. I was the only one who could uh, teach French, right? And uh, the other one... She taught English and German. I made lots of friends among the staff because most of the teachers, of course, were doctors. We had good company, spent a lot of time together, and well, it was just fun. So you're working in a school. Was it very different to the way you'd been schooled? Well, compared to what? To Britain. Well, I have kind of, you know, a divided, split feelings about those school days because it was uh, Victorian-style schooling very strict discipline a lot of spanking but none, none of that in the soviet union no you none of that no. corporal punishment was uh, strictly prohibited in the soviet union so how did you maintain discipline was oh, it a problem? Well, when i came from britain i was used to this kind of to victorian discipline so i was well behaved but the other kids, no, they're just, you know, very rowdy and noisy. But it, of course, it, it depended on the teacher. If the teacher could get the kids interested and do a proper job with the sub subject, the kids would, most of them at least, would be get interested and listen. But, you know, it always happens that there are two or three of them who uh, are not interested in anything. So they are the rowdy ones. It cause all the trouble, misbehave and this and that. And, uh, but once again, it's all the, it's the personality of the teacher that mattered. At my school was just the teacher who was the most authoritative person. You had to sit straight, right, at a desk. And if you misbehave for something, you get pulled out and you get the slipper from the teacher. Or if it's a more serious offence, you get dragged to the head teacher's office and he uses the cane. <laughs> yeah, more painful. <laughs> yeah. So I went back during one of my travels to England. This was, what, the 1990s, I think, mid-90s. I went to my school. I came to Bingley and went to the school. I introduced myself to the head teacher, very nice guy, and he was very, you know, interested in what I had to say. And he took me on the tour of the school. And it was all there. I mean, you know, the same walls, but the, the, the environment, I mean, the situation, the atmosphere was totally different. The first question I asked, okay, show me where you hide the cane. Where's the cane? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, we don't have canes anymore. We don't. So uh, we went on that tour of the school and it was all there. I went into my class where I used to go uh, study. And uh, I remember that we were sat in uh, strict uh, rows, your desks, and uh, we had to sit with our arms folded and sit straight and the teacher would be always glaring at us. And <laughs> so it was really kind of uh, depressing. But when I came into my classroom and saw the, the kids crawling all over the floor, the teacher on the floor with them and giving them all sorts of individual tasks. And I mean, they were just having fun. <laughs> so I talked to the kids and uh, told them what it was like in the 1950s and they wouldn't believe it. <laughs> no, I'm surprised. Yeah, they, it's like another world, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, entirely. Entirely different world. So. Was it more like it would have been in the Soviet Union? Or was it sort of a combination? Well, no, when you were no. The up? Soviet Union was much more lenient, I'd say, at school. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I mean... You had more fun in <laughs> yeah. schools here. Yes, it was much more lenient. Um, and what about the standards of education? I mean, in the Soviet Union, I've heard a lot from people who were raised in the Soviet Union that they had the best standard of education in the world. Do you think that was true? Well, I would agree with that. I can't think of any kind of creative activities that we've had. Maybe it's all different now, right? With the kids crawling oh, all yeah. over the place. and they're giving Things have changed projects. a little bit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in those days, things were drilled into us, right? I mean, we had spelling tests during language classes. I mean, the language class would begin with maths, uh, would uh, begin with uh, doing a set of 20 sums. And mostly it was about money, counting money, the old money, you know, not the pounds, shillings, pences, fartings, and all sorts of Farthings, things. Farthings, I think uh, you meant. Well, <laughs> 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 Sorry for the <laughs> 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 Yeah, I don't know. That's a Freudian slip.
But um, yes. yeah, a lot of cabbage in those days as well. well. Yeah, that's right. But look, <laughs> I, I haven't pronounced the word farthing for, I don't know, for donkey's years. Yeah, so, well, why uh, would the you? other word is uh, it's much, much more typical, isn't it, in my yes. vocabulary? Yes, <laughs> uh, well, we'll not go there. You're listening to Understanding Russia. But uh, <laughs> I knew cabbages would find their way in here somehow. But uh, I'm, I'm more interested in, you eventually became a headmaster, didn't you, in I one did, of those schools? I did, yes. Yeah. Came as a surprise, but I was practically the youngest headmaster in the district. And I was, what, 27 at the time. The school that I spent another three years, it was in the same area, same district. I was actually assigned to that school because nobody else wanted the job. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I spent three years there. And I thought, well, once again, I had ambitious plans. I mean, I wanted to change this school and make something out of it. I tried to introduce some of the ideas, like, you know, more modern ideas in terms of uh, the curriculum, make, making it uh, probably more available to students, not just the teacher-student one-way relationship, but I was trying to create a situation where there'd be more feedback from the students. So this is a whole... Was it a success or was it, is it the subject of well, a future I, movie? Well, I was getting there. Mm -hmm. I was getting there after three years. And of course, there was the infrastructure thing. I mean, it had to be, a school had to be renovated and things. So I was step by step getting there. And I don't know if I'd stayed for much longer, I might have achieved more, but at least it was at the beginning. But another thing got in the way and, uh, and that's how I ended up in Belgrade, really, because uh, and I had, uh, well, a friend. We uh, used to live together when I was at university in Minsk. We used to rent a, a flat, right? during the first year. So he was a university student, Belarusian State University. Oh, uh, the other BSU. Yes, the other BSU, okay. Belarusian State University student. He was at law school there. He was three or four years older than me because he came, he went to university straight from the army. Uh, we lived together for about a year. And then when I got a place in a residence hall and uh, he also got his own place at his university. We kind of, you know, went out different ways. Some years later, this was what, maybe uh, probably eight or nine years later, I was sitting my in my headmaster's office at the school and uh, the telephone starts ringing. I pick up the phone and say, oh, this is the party committee. Oh, I thought this is serious then. I mean, who from the district party committee wants to talk to me? A lowly headmaster in a rural school. Yeah. And uh, I hear a familiar voice. Oh, is, is that you, Val? And blah, blah, blah. And so on. And I hear the voice and I say, look, uh, and I remember his name. I said, is that by any chance you, Alexander? He said, yes, it is. And so it turned out that uh, out he'd uh, graduated from law school. He got a position in the, you know, Communist Party higher chain of command hierarchy. And he was actually being an exemplary communist and, and a very good student. He was quickly promoted to quite a high rank in the Communist Party hierarchy. He was in the regional regional communist communist party establishment and he was he was they called them instructors instructors so instructors were like the, uh, the people who would make all the uh, you know those communist things happen I mean, they're the ones who would, they were like intermediaries. They would pass down uh, the communist the instructions, instructions from, the, from, yeah. the, from the, the high authorities down to the lower ones, right? So they were like intermediaries. So he, he was quite an important position in those days. So he was at regional level, which is a level higher than district level, right? Because you have district level, regional level, Republican level, and central, meaning Moscow, right? So he was with the regional level, an instructor, and he came down to our district to inspect the local communist organization and their activities. And when he uh, looked at the list of uh, administrators in the district, including school headmasters as well, he saw my name. So he asked, more f he asked uh, the local authorities to get in touch with me and uh, we met up. He came down to the school and we had a, you know, a nice uh, reunion. And then he said, look, what the hell are you doing here in this, using one of Mr. Trump's words, <laughs> In this backwater valley, yeah? <laughs> well, you know, well, I must use it saying what he said, really, yeah. Yeah, but in, in the backwater. I said, well, you see what I'm doing? I'm in charge of this school, trying to get things done. And said, look, he said, with your English, 
you should be somewhere else. You should be teaching English at university level at least. I said, well, I'm afraid it's not going to happen because they won't let me go. And, uh, well, I did have plans like that, but, you know, I think I'm stuck here, so that's about it. And he said, okay, let me work on that. So he went back to the district center and told the local communist party leader, look, you have that guy sitting in, in that place he Miles from anywhere. Yeah, he doesn't fit there, right? He needs to do this and that. And he told them my story. And, uh, you know, he said, he's, he's a native speaker of English. He should be, you know, using his language skills in other places. Well, step by step, things started to happen. And uh, see, I married a girl from uh, the university and uh, we were in the same group together and uh, her parents had moved to Belgrade. She was urging me to move to Belgrade and we came out here a couple of times just to visit and uh, <clears throat> I found out about the Pedagogical Institute and they had a foreign languages department so I just made some inquiries. <clears throat> the first two were unsuccessful because despite the fact that I was a native speaker, I wasn't wanted because of, uh, you know, the number of places. It didn't happen for probably three years, but on my third visit, when I uh, came to Belgrade, I just, you know, thought, well, just, you know, have a look again and go in and see what they have to say. And they said, oh, we have a, we have a position opening up in September. So they interviewed me and said, yeah, we'd like to have you here. And I thought, well, this might be my chance. So when I went back, I started talking to the local authorities saying, look, I've got a chance to uh, go and teach English properly, right? And maybe start working on a dissertation and do some research work. And that's basically was my first ambition, bearing in mind what the instructor had told them in those days. <laughs> uh, they uh, actually eventually let me go. So I arrive in Belgorod, and the first thing I learn is that they want me at the Belgorod Communist Party Committee. I thought, what's this all about? And, when, and so I went to Belgorod Party Committee, and uh, there's this guy who says, look, we received information from Belarus, and we know that you worked as a head teacher for two years, and, uh, well, you were doing quite a good job. So we'd like to uh, you to be a head teacher in Belgrade as well. If you do that, we'll, uh, during a year or two, maybe we'll give you a flat. <clears throat> but you need to, uh, it's like, you know, a party mission, communist party mission, right? And we'd like to uh, offer you a position as head teacher in one of the schools of Belgrade, school number 35, I said it, I think it was. I said, no, sorry, because uh, I came to Belgrade. I moved to Belgrade for one reason alone, to work at the university, write a dissertation, and uh, that's what I intend to do. If I'm not wanted here, I might as well go back to Belarus. Well, this kind of situation dragged on for about a year maybe, but I was working at the university, at the institute already, and then they just you know, probably got fed up with my stubbornness or something and they just let me go. <clears throat> yes, you're an old stubborn guy. If you yeah. Think. Yeah. You're listening to Understanding Russia. I'll touch on this because one of the interesting things for our foreign listeners is this whole Communist Party thing. Outside of the Communist bloc, nobody really understands what it was all about. <laughs> so, I mean, how influential was it? So, you were a card-carrying member of yeah, the Communist well, I was, Party. I, I was compelled to do that because of my position. It didn't you, you matter whether I wanted it, uh, yeah. wanted to, do, to be a party member or not. But to be completely honest, it was beneficial, of course, to be a party member because it would open all sorts of <clears throat> possibilities, right? So it wasn't a political decision, it was an economic decision, really? Well, basically, yes. Right. I mean, did you did you have to pass some sort of test in order to join the party? Not really a test. Had to, you had to be interviewed and you had to agree with the party politics and, you know... Say yes a lot. Yeah. In America, in the 1950s, were famous for the McCarthyite trials. Have you ever been associated with the Communist yeah. Party? Were there any kind of similar situations? Have you ever been associated with the Democratic Party or...? Well, there was no such thing as a Democratic well, Party. Well, indeed. Yeah, but but we, we still were kind of liberals. I mean, the fact that we... Uh, were graduates of foreign languages institution. And the other fact that I 
you know, been born and raised in Britain, uh, though Britain, I can't say, was much of a liberal country in those days either, and I had no idea what all this political stuff was about, but it was probably my genes somehow. That's why I felt more or less like a liberal, because I, I wasn't a completely yes man in those days, because I had my own ideas and I would voice them if I felt I needed to. And, Is that uh, the plague of individualism, the ghost of individualism coming yeah, through? For that period of time, it could be. You can't say that this was, you know, a mass kind of thing, right? So it was all about, you know, being led and guided by the Communist Party and that's it. And that's the way we have to go. But you know what? Whatever they say about the Communist time in the West, during my travels to America, my first mission in America was to teach Russian in 1987. And I was sent to Portland in Oregon. And uh, I spent some time in Oregon and in Boston as well during the same uh, period of time. And I stayed with a family in Boston and uh, the head of the family was an architect and he, he was a member of the church council. So he invited me to church a couple of times and we went to the service and things and uh, then he asked me to address the church council. Well, from what I saw and understood from the way the church council operated and worked and uh, the standing of the members of the church council, there was absolutely no difference between <laughs> being a member of the Communist Party <laughs> section <laughs> at school or university and a member of the church council in the United States. So it's a discipline thing. Yeah, the same thing. Exactly. Yeah, that will surprise many, I think. But I understand what you mean. There's a sort of collectivism about church yeah. affairs that is similar to communist yeah. affairs, I suppose. I mean, look at all the commandments of uh, the church and the communist party. They're the same. They just have uh, a different name. Secular religion. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's quite a curious thing. But as for the politics, the statements that came out of communism during that time were, you know, very... I suppose, sort of broad, like we are the people of the world, let's all unite together and overcome poverty and all this sort of thing. Did people really believe that? When you look at the communist theory, because we had to study the theory, it was called Marxism and Leninism, right? We had a special subject at university. That theory really made sense. Well, we realize now that it was utopian, but when you're 20, in the early 20s, and you, and you read that stuff and you start to believe in it, it really makes sense. I mean, it was all laid out by Marx, Engels, and, uh, and even Lenin, right? In a very logical and uh, fascinating and appealing way. Theoretically, it was uh, a very good and fair ideology. I would say. But unfortunately, the way it was implemented was entirely different. And now when they talk about communism and communists, it sounds like a dirty word. And, be, and that's not because of the theory, it's because of the way the system was implemented, starting with the Soviet Union, right? It was like chalk and cheese, the huge difference between theory and the way it was implemented. But when we were in our early twenties, we kind of believed in that theory. And uh, as time went on and we grew older and more mature and more experienced and entered real life, we could see that it was, you know, the theory turned into a utopia. We saw that things are not going to happen. So what did you think of foreigners in this context? I mean, going back to your early 20s, your sort of utopian vision of the world, did you see Westerners as a kind of victims of capitalism or victims of circumstances? No, or? no not at all. Not at all. Actually, uh, it was typical for Soviets to uh, hold foreigners in respect, really, because they knew about the standards. I mean, it was hearsay, right? There were, I mean, not so much concrete evidence, just some people who traveled to the West who were in certain party positions or government positions to do so. But mainly it was just hearsay, right, of uh, living standards and, uh, and uh, radio programs. Uh, but I was one who lived in the West, though I was uh, a kid but I still had my memories and I still had my attitudes and my understanding. No, the uh, attitude towards foreigners was very positive, really. I'd say even respectful in many ways. Did that go for the sort of upper classes, aristocratic types, or was it more of a sort of solidarity with the people type idea? Well, not really. I mean, well, in our family, I don't know, it's uh, kind of strange, but, uh, well, my parents both come from very humble beginnings. When they lived in England, they came to respect not only the British way of life, but uh, the laws and, uh, you know, the judicial ways. And uh, they always told me, look, England is a very fair country. The laws and ways are very fair. And uh, 
that's what we came to believe. And I think that for the 1950s, that was probably true, right? Because every time they kept telling us how fair the system is, and well, we lived in that system, but we didn't understand the system because as kids, we felt protected. The parents looked after us. We went to school, we had our own house, and I had my English grandparents, not biological ones, but they were my foster uh, grandparents. So I was, you know, I lived a very comfortable life. So you had a rosy vision of Britain. Yeah. It didn't conflict with your vision of growing up in the Soviet Union. Well, at first it was, I had to go through a very grim period and I even planned to run away, right? And escape back to Britain, which of course was <laughs> daydreaming and totally impossible. Well, you get used to things, especially when you're a kid and you're a teenager and you live through that period. So, you know, gradually, step by step, when you uh, start making friends, uh, you go to school. The thing about Britain was that I had no kin, I had no relatives, no blood relatives. But here I was surrounded with, you know, lots of relatives, cousins, aunts, uncles, and that was, that added to my uh, developing positive attitude to the new environment in which I'd found myself, right? You're listening to Understanding Russia. Apart from the family situation, what's your most rosy memory of the Soviet Union? What did you like about it? What was good about it? Once again, looking back at, the, at my green years, once I'd made friends, once I learnt about the system, and uh, I, I'd say, well, this is a, a grown-up attitude, not a teenage attitude, but uh, the fact is that if you learn to beat the system, you'll be doing okay. As a kid, yeah. Well, as I said, you get used to all sorts of things. But I mean, there was a heavy focus on sport, yeah. and you, I know you're a keen footballer. Yeah, I started playing football in England. We had regular training sessions, so I came to Russia fully equipped as a kid football player. I had a shirt, I had shorts, I had socks, I had boots, and boots were unheard of in, in uh, our small town, right? And uh, actually my training actually showed. I mean, I played a different kind of football from what the local kids played. And I must say that the kids from our Belarusian town where I lived, they were, in their own way, they were very skilled and talented players, and nobody trained them. It was just that they liked football and they did it. And I'd come out fully dressed in my kit. And Was it a Bradford kit? Uh, no, it was just a school kit, just uh, black and white stripes, really. It was, uh, I pinched the school kit. Newcastle. Like Newcastle, Newcastle United. Yeah, yeah, it did look like Newcastle, right. I mean, uh, I don't think it was possible in those days to have professional football club uh, kits oh, in yeah. the 1950s. I suppose not. No. So anyway, I would come out onto the field, to the pitch, dressed up in the whole kit and sporting boots and things. And all the local kids, they, you know, they like ragamuffins and, uh, and they played barefoot. <laughs> and, and here I am standing in, in front of him in full uh, kit and boots and things. So what happened? That's probably when I had to say goodbye to my boots because everyone wanted to play with boots and with my boots. And what they would do, they'd ask, for, you know, I'd give one person a right, my right foot boot, another one, the left foot one goes to another person. So, they, and they take turns in playing <laughs> in, in one boot each. And I, I was left basically with nothing. So I had to go and get some bumpers. We called them bumpers in those days. Like I had a pair of bumpers or a couple of pair of bumpers from England. And in England, we never played in bumpers or what they call trainers. Pump, pumps, you mean? No, bumpers. There I've was never a special, heard of that. Ah, well, that's a 1950s term wow. for trainers, right? Bit of language archaeology right there. Well, there you are. So we called them bumpers. So I had to go back and get a pair of bumpers and play in my bumpers, which I'd never done before in England. Playing football in bumpers was unheard of. So but, you were the Pele of Belarus right well, there. Well, actually, I started as a goalkeeper, really. Oh, that dog, yeah. um, I, I think what they did they is they, they, looked, they, they looked at your boots <laughs> and went, yeah. put him in goal, <laughs> yeah. he won't need them. <laughs> I think you were had there, Val. <laughs> But I mean, I got fed up with being a goalkeeper, so I went up front and became a, a forward after that. But yeah, but see, um, the thing is, it, it, is, this concerned England as well and Russia, because look, 1950s in England, and there were lean years, right? With not many options for kids and their entertainment. So as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. That was true for Britain of the 1950s for kids and the Soviet Union as well. I and mean, we invented our own games. And well, in Britain, we used to go uh, roam the streets uh, dressed up in our cowboy fits with, you know, 
to uh, yeah, shoot two, us, six, shooters. six shooters yeah. on our side. Roy Rogers and all that. Yes, it's all Roy Rogers, Lone Ranger and things like that. And uh, we played those games. In Russia, of course, it wasn't cowboys and Indians, it was Germans and Russians. Yes, <laughs> fascists versus fascist, communists. Yes. Yeah. So who, who won those ones? Well, Always the communists, I'd imagine. Yes, yeah. of course. Did they make you play as a German? Not really, no. I could. Uh, I said, look, Britain, I mean, we were allies. On the same we, side. On the same side, because well, my father kept telling Telling these war stories and things, so we're on the same side. So I, w- I would stand out as an English soldier then. So. That's a very strange situation. <laughs> yes. So yeah. But anyway, the kind of entertainment we had. At first, I was a loner. Right, for first maybe a year or so, I was a loner. And I would invent my own games. Right, in um, Britain we had a game called shoot. It was it was like tiddlywinks. If you know what tiddlywinks yes. is all about, so it was very. Familiar. Look it up it on was, Wikipedia, yeah, folks, was, yes. if you don't know. So it's basically like tiddlywinks. But I upgraded that game. Well, I had no uh, tiddlywink set, but I invented another game. I called it Button Football. I started gathering, collecting buttons wherever I when could. You, when you say gathering buttons, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, I meant stealing. All right, <laughs> I thought you did. Yeah, yeah. I've heard this before. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So uh, I organized my own uh, first division league, English teams, and I played all by myself by matching the teams and having my own first division championship, English championship. Right? So I was, <laughs> and I played this button football. Then some friends I'd made uh, in the village, they started looking at this. They also, they were keen footballers and things. So, oh, we'd like to do that as well. So I started a whole, you know, thing with button football. And that led to another kind of thing because I was the only one, as I said, gathering buttons. <laughs> Uh, that harvesting, meant, <laughs> yes, yeah. harvesting buttons. That meant that those uh, kids. I didn't do this. I actually uh, cut buttons off my parents' coats and trousers, and the balls which we used fly buttons from my uh, father's trousers were perfect balls for, <laughs> for this purpose. <laughs> I bet he was pleased. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, at least they knew where they went. Yeah. <laughs> they were the same. They were in my team, so they could always get them back. But okay. I had, to, I had to hide them, though. I had to hide them from my parents, from my brother. They all wanted it because they wanted them back. But these other kids, when they were at school, they'd ask to go to the toilet during the class and they'd go out and sneak into the cloakroom and start snipping off the <laughs> off buttons from... Oh, it was them, from, not yeah, you. Not okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see. Well, I, I did it in my own family, right? Oh, but okay. they did it out in the school. Then the head teacher's son was one of the button football players and he was caught red-handed the, the headmaster's son and we were banned from playing button football after that so we had to go underground okay so we we had to we had our own world championships every person had his own country to represent so we had to have these uh, world championships somewhere in in hiding really we had to go into hiding and it was like we take turns at you were hiding from the authorities in this case your parents and the head teacher well i mean everyone was furious with us parents and teachers <laughs> and uh, our own parents they were furious with us because we were absolutely totally banned from playing button football and Play. word got around the whole village and you know especially girls i mean the 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 buttons on girls coats were very good for our game so every time they come back the parents would check and <laughs> check their coats the buttons. Are, are the buttons there or not <laughs> <laughs> That's stuff you find in Soviet movies, isn't it, really? You're listening to Understanding Russia. What about when you were older? I mean, what benefits did you perceive you were getting from the Soviet system that you perhaps wouldn't have had from a Western system? Did you perceive that well, or not? I, I don't think so, because, I mean, you really had to work hard. I mean, if you had parents who were in these sophisticated official positions, then, you know, you, I mean, it's the same in the West. You, you're you like, favor, you get, you know. Connections, connections make a difference. Yeah, right, yeah. and they work. It was the same here, same there. But for me, I had to prove myself everywhere I went. I had to work very hard. And uh, when I came to Belgrade, for instance, when I started working at 
the pedagogical institute, well, the dean said, oh, we can use your skills as headmaster, so I'm going to appoint you deputy dean. So starting with year two, I was the deputy dean for five years. But see, unlike now, that was kind of responsibility. It wasn't a position, it was a responsibility. You didn't get paid for it. So that basically meant double workload. Assistant dean plus full-time teacher, right? Double load. Did you get double money for that? Well, that's what I say. I did't. You didn't I, got get mis- I got miserable. I didn't get any money for that position at all. So we didn't get paid for. That was called social work. Yes. Social work. Volunteering for the people. Yes. So uh, I, I did that for five years. But there was uh, one beneficial thing that came out of that was that I was given green light to start working on my thesis. And when I was given a sabbatical, right, uh, for one year to go to Moscow and complete my thesis, my social work as a deputy dean was taken into account. So that was probably the only benefit I had. So you were a good communist. I wouldn't call myself a communist, but it was a just a, let's say, worker, right? Yes. Yeah, working hard. So, so you never... just, It was a treadmill, really. You never really thought about things like that poli- politically. No, right? not it, really, it wasn't no. a thing. Well, we had to attend uh, monthly communist meetings, right? But those were all about work. It's it was you know it's like the church council dealing with their church problems, and at communist party meetings at the institute or at the faculty, we were just dealing with uh, and discussing daily academic and other kind of problems. Nothing connected with ideology, really. It's just. So there were two major themes about the Cold War that dominated sort of Western ideas of what the Cold War was. One was nuclear holocaust. Did you ever think about that when you were raised in the Soviet Union? Well, when we arrived the first years, yes. Well, we didn't know much about this uh, thing when we were in England because we were probably too young and weren't interested in politics. But when, when we came to Russia, this was the beginning of the early 60s. It was a serious Cold War, you mean, the Caribbean crisis and The Cuban crisis, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had actually sirens going off during the day and we had to rush to bomb shelters and try and hide it. We went, had to go to that training. So that was a, a vivid reminder of what could have happened. How frequent was that? Well, it, there was a period, especially at the height of the tensions between Soviet Union and America being connected with the Cuban crisis. It was every day, really. Every day? Yeah. But the amazing thing is, when I went to the United States in 1987 and I was invited to give talks to all sorts of people, schools and business circles, communities, and uh, I was told the same thing. When I kept telling them about this tension and the sirens and the bomb shelters, they said in America, well, we went through the same thing, exactly the same thing. So there was a, a an element of paranoia about the whole thing. Yes, of course. In the US and in the UK, we didn't have an equivalent, really, of the KGB. What is the average Soviet citizen's attitude to the KGB? We just knew about it. We didn't know what it was all about. It was just some something, you know, vague thing that... Like an equivalent to, like, you knowing about the CIA if you're an yeah, American. FBI, you didn't know, know what they were doing, but yeah, you, you knew they were yeah, there. Yeah, no, I, I mean, what they're up to. Were you scared that they were listening into conversations or spying no, on people? N- no, you no. You never, never thought about ne- it ever. never occurred to us they'd be doing something like that. So it's just that, well, we knew they were there. We know they, uh, they were there and they're supposed to protect the country. We never thought of all other activities that went, uh, they were up to, and we didn't have an idea, really. And we were not really concerned because we just, you know, we were we're getting on with our lives and uh, our lives had nothing to do with uh, political, you know, subversion or something like that. It just, you know. There was a whole thing in the 80s about Soviet dissidents, you know, uh, Andrei Sakharov and people like that. And they, yeah. they made out that the Soviet people were struggling to be free and that these people were examples of how the Soviets were su- repressed by their own regime. They used to use these sorts well, of words. Well, that's another exaggeration, I would say, because uh, the absolute majority uh, felt comfortable w- w- with what they already had. Well, of course, compared to probably the West, where probably there was much more freedom. Pro- I'm saying probably, because uh, in the West, they, they also had their own restrictions and, you know, no laws to follow and rules and things like that. So all these freedoms and uh, democratic things, they're all very, they're just there probably to play the game, right? So you, they're all very relative. Yeah. If you're a Soviet sitting looking out the West, you don't necessarily think there's freedom, I wish it was here. No, no. We, I mean, the only thing we'd look at the West for was, uh, with, uh, would be all, all the goods that they have. So it's, it was 
it was basic consumerism, really. Nothing ideological. Basic consumerism. Oh, they have all that stuff there. We'd like to have that stuff here as well. So blue jeans and nice cars and yes, all that sort of thing. Yes, yes. Yeah? Well, yeah, everything connected with consumerism, right? Good clothes, right? But there was never an ideological element to it, really. Well, not really. I mean, uh, the ideological element came only during these Communist Party meetings that, you know, uh, talk about ideological differences. But in everyday life, uh, we, it was nothing really. I mean, okay, we knew about the West, we knew about us, uh, we have our own lifestyle, and we were happy in our own way. Well, what we tried to do, as I told you before, is we tried to find ways, cunning ways to beat the system. If you know how to beat the system, you're in business, okay? And that's fine. So you could get certain things. I mean, one of the one of the famous imports into Russia or the Soviet Union at the time was uh, the Beatles records. They arrived yeah. in the 70s, I think. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so that was an indication that things could be done if you knew the right people. And if, in fact, they, they bowed to popular demand and issued reissued the Beatles albums on uh, on their local imprint, yes. Melodia, I think yeah. it was, in, in the Soviet yes. Union. So we have some of those antique records still kicking around now. They, they were trying to become more consumerist, but the, everybody knows about the shortages in the 1980s, right? Yeah, that's true. You must have felt those as well. Of course, yes. And... How did that make you feel about the system as a whole? Were you becoming disenchanted with it or did you feel like, well, this is just a, a, a glitch on the way to, you know, solving the no, problem? No, we already started to understand that this is something much more serious, right? Because we were promised communism by 1980 by Mr. Khrushchev, right? And from the theoretical books about Marxism and Leninism, we had a good idea what communism is all about, theoretically. <laughs> but we could understand and see that we're going absolutely in the opposite direction, right? So it was yeah, very disappointing. Uh, we were disillusioned, angry, frustrated. Uh, yeah, it was all coming. You're listening to Understanding Russia. And what did you think about Gorbachev when he arrived? It was like a breath of fresh air. New ideas, right? New relations, possibility to travel with very few restrictions. That was really something extremely positive. That was at first with Perestroika and all this stuff. Glasnost. Yeah. But uh, unfortunately, those people led by Gorbachev, they didn't really have a clear idea which way they're going, what to do right? And how to do it. They had no experience. They knew that they're being guided by Communist Party principles and they were stuck in that ideology. By opening up the country was one positive thing, but it wasn't enough. And that's why everything turned into a mess in the 1990s, right? And we entered the, what I call the turbulent 90s period, right? Yeah, the Wild East. Yes. You mentioned Gorbachev. In the West, Gorbachev is seen as a sort of anti-hero figure who cooperated with the West and saw reason and tried to open up the Soviet Union. And for the, from Western eyes, Gorbachev was a hero. He's not a hero in the Soviet Union. In fact, a lot of my friends who lived through that period, they mention it and say, well, oh, I don't want to talk about him. I mean, he's he's not someone we, we're proud of anymore, or even at the time. But uh, as far as I understand it, he was a bit of a maverick. He was he was a, a go-getter. He was a very able and intelligent man. And yet his legacy has been one of, well, he destroyed the Soviet Union. And for a lot of people, that was a terrible thing to do. This is what's confusing, perhaps, for a foreign audience, is how people regarded this collapsing situation in the Soviet Union during the 1980s. I mean, there was there was the Afghan war. Did that have an effect on the way people thought about communism? The, the Afghan war had a really negative impact. They didn't believe. I mean, it was promoted and it was uh, advertised as uh, doing our international duty. But we understood that internationalism is not about, you know, invading another country with guns and tanks and bombs. And we, we understood that perfectly well. Well, I lost a close friend in the Afghan war actually. He was an officer in the army and got killed and uh, and so did many others. Yeah, that was a, probably a, a time when people really started to realize that it's not just, uh, you know, the economic situation in the country. It's all this what they call internationalism stuff, which is basically aggression. And we don't want that. Most people were against the Afghan war because it affected their lives. I mean, thousands of families had lost their sons and relatives in that war. Who wants that? It's one thing when you're fighting for your own country, right? 
But when you're fighting for somebody else's interests, and what kind of interests are they interested in and we don't know much about, why do we need that? And also, this is at a time of shortages. Yes, and combined with shortages, with economic depression, yes, all these things together brought about a feeling of necessity for something. These new things started to happen, but they got, you know, mired down in bureaucracy, in misunderstanding, in the absence of uh, real proper leadership and guidelines. Nobody knew where, where we're going, which way we're going. I suppose the impression I get from those years was this singular lack of imagination. There seemed to be no new ideas and fresh ideas being generated within the Soviet Union itself and a general frustration that nothing was happening. Nobody was moving. There was no leadership, as you say. When you were looking towards the West in those days, did people think that the West had all those solutions to hand, that they, they could come in and, and revamp society at the time in the Soviet Union? Or was it beyond? On, could you not see that happening? Did you not imagine that would ever be the case at the time? No, actually, we believed that something like that would happen. We were looking at the West as a possible example of how things should be in Russia, right? So we had big hopes. We had big hopes for another kind of future, but eventually it brought about another feeling of disappointment and frustration. Well, that was interesting. In the next part of our interview, uh, we will engage with the 90s and life in contemporary Russia. And I hope you'll join us then. Thank you for listening to Understanding Russia. If you want to contact us, you can get in touch with us via our website at urpod.net, where you can find all our social media links, or via email, understandingrussia at gmail.com. We will be very happy to hear from you. You have been listening to Understanding Russia a student-led podcast from Belgorod State University.